Uh, what's up, Kennedy? How you been, brother? Actually, everybody's calling you Kennedy Cole. Kennedy Cole is, by the way, is my microphone loud enough? I have problems with StreamYard often with this setup. Does it work fine? That sounds great. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, I'm good, man. No heated, though, <laughs> um, Kennedy, I wanted to. Oh, man, I'm so, I'm so, I'm. My head is so not in the right place. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> We're going to brawl after this show's over. Okay. Um, I honestly wanted to talk about a bunch of things tonight with you, Kennedy, but you uh, you messaged me the other night and you were like, dude, I kind of want to tell everybody how I got to the point where I am where, because everybody sees Kennedy as this radical traditionalist who says he'll never go to the Novus Ordo. He'd rather die than go to the Novus Ordo. So there, I, I know I've heard that you were a teacher and you had to leave that job. Um, but I never like heard what those circumstances were. Yeah, I never said I wouldn't go. I said I wouldn't participate. <clears throat> um, see, misinformation, you know. Um, that's true information about my beard, but misinformation <laughs> about what I said. Um, and it was a play on a show that Father Franks from the SSPX had produced during the COVID time when everyone was making videos. And he talked about how uh, as a priest, he would rather die than say the Novus Ordo. Uh, and it was it was um, a little bit tongue in cheek as a title, but like he believes that that's pretty much what every traditional priest believes if you actually ask them on it. That's why they don't say it. They might keep their heads, they might keep their heads down in order not to get canceled, but they believe it. Uh, otherwise they just say it. Um, and I said, participate, not attend. So for example, uh, you know, for a reason of charity, uh, someone's wedding or something like that, then you go to support. I just, I'm not uh, a big fan of Bunini. Um, anyway, um, as far as how I got where I got, I was a teacher. I was a Catholic school teacher. I don't know if people are aware of uh, the teaching or the Catholic schools in Ontario in this province. Uh, they're actually funded by the provincial government fully, um, which is a nightmare because that means that they do everything the government says. Uh, there was a time when it wasn't bad because society was relatively sane and it was sort of like, you know, Ontario is like 40% baptized Catholic. It's actually historically pretty Catholic. Um, yes, Quebec is historically very Catholic, but so is Ontario and the rest of Canada. And um, anyway, so, but it became to the point where Catholic schools are just public schools with crosses on the door. Uh, usually they're resurrexifixes and not crucifixes, which tells you everything you need to know. Um, you you were a teacher at a Catholic school? Yes. Oh, wow. I thought you were a public school teacher. No. Well, they're publicly funded. I was a teacher okay. at a Catholic school, uh, um, and I ended up getting canceled. Um, I have, well, it doesn't matter all the details, but I never did to go fund me for mine, but I was run out of town. Um, uh, just That's not a dig at anybody. It's just I didn't do it. Um, and I just found another career. But uh, I was basically canceled for teaching the Catholic faith in a religion class as a religion teacher, as a Catholic school teacher. And uh, in November 2022, at the end of this long process with the um, Ontario College of Teachers, um, which I, if you follow the Jordan Peterson phenomenon at all, when he had this regulatory board that was going after his license, same thing. He just happens to be famous. Mine was just with a different regulatory board, another pseudo-governmental organization that can't actually do anything to you legally, but can make your life a living hell professionally. So I got to the point where I, I hadn't been teaching since 2020. I took a leave of absence, uh, you know, voluntarily, um, partly for COVID reasons. I really wasn't about to enforce masks at all on students because I'd never actually bought one or wore one myself. So I wasn't about to make a, wasn't going to make somebody else do it. Um, and I just knew the whole thing was nonsense. I wasn't just going to participate in that if I could help it. Now, if I couldn't have helped it, I would have just had to seethe and just put up with it like many people. I'm not saying anyone's a bad person. If they had to just put up with it, that's a different thing. Um, but thanks be to God, Terror of Demons, uh, it was it struck gold. Um, it wasn't a million dollars or anything like that, but I put that book out not knowing what would happen. And I was able to basically replace my income or most of it with just that book in a year, which was insane. Um, and then I was able to uh, get a part-time job with the Fatima Center, which was fine. And I was able to just, you know, support my family. And it, was, it worked out fine. Um, but anyway, I, I was on a leave of absence. And I went through this two-year process of going back and forth 
um, with the regulatory body through a lawyer, that sort of stuff. And it got to the point where, um, when I should add, it, it took so long because of COVID, because everyone was on Zoom, all the things were backed up. It was too dangerous to actually be competent anymore. Um, so therefore, things that would usually take six months took two years. Um, so otherwise, it would have it would have happened faster. But eventually, in November 2022, I had to sign a document. <laughs> I wish I have a copy somewhere. I, I can't find it right now. But it's one of the most proud moments of my life because I had to sign that I admitted to all these things. And like one of them was saying like feminism was a festering disease. I admitted to that. Uh, and this, by the way, wasn't while I was teaching. This was in my like books and stuff, not even in the classroom. None of this Wait, was actually from the classroom. Who made you sign this? A lawyer. Um, so here's what it was. I had the option to either um, fight the Ontario College of Teachers on my own dime. And if I lost... I had to pay their legal fees. That's called oh, wow. racketeering, by the way. That's called racketeering. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, it'd be a sh it'd be a shame if somebody blew up your your, your shop, you know, you know, and uh, yeah. so pay us two hundred dollars a week, and we won't blow it up. That's what that is. Um, or I could admit to being a meanie poo poo head, and I could sign a document, and um, just consulted with my wife, and and I'd already been through a lot, you know. When I, man, oh man, when I was teaching. I ended up getting physically ill at one point uh, because of all the pressure. I would just literally teach the catechism. Like there was a time when I was in the principal's office. Um, <laughs> I was in the principal's office. I never got in any official trouble because I never actually did anything wrong. But the curriculum was surprisingly actually pretty Catholic and used the John Paul II catechism for pretty much every citation in the, in the curriculum. And the curriculum was like this big. So like you only ever get through a quarter of it. No teacher ever. Yeah. It's like I used to teach Canadian history. If you could get past World War II and into the baby boomer era, you would be happy that you finished most of the 20th century. Like that was yeah. as far as you would ever get. You know, you wouldn't even get to the 60s and 70s. And uh, so I would teach, you know, just like I would follow the curriculum. And I followed it to a T. Like when I would teach something that was controversial, I would literally record myself on my iPhone so and I would tell accuse the, you of something later. And I had to use that one time. There was a student who um, asked me if uh, he was going to hell because he wasn't baptized. And um, I s didn't say yes or no. Obviously, I can't tell him where he's going anyway. But I said, this is what the Catholic Church teaches on baptism. And I said, there are also the modes of uh, baptism by martyrdom and baptism of desire. And I just explained it. And... Mm -hmm. um, because he had said to me he wasn't sure if he was baptized, but he knew that he was dedicated. So some sort of Protestant background. And his dad was a teacher in the Catholic system, by the way. It just shows you the level of uh, orthodoxy required. And um, he, I didn't see him at school the next day. I mean, he was one of those kids who was absent all the time. Or not all the time, but sometimes. And um, whatever. I get this crazy email from his dad, who was a colleague of mine. Different school, but on the same board, same town. And... Uh, <laughs> There was, it was so crazy. It was like, I felt bad for the man that he actually was so angry that he could write such an email. Like there were parts where he used like size 36 font in the midst of like 12 font, like 14 font, 24 font, and then like 36, like it was a crescendo of anger. And he accused me of hate speech and breaking the law. And I was like a criminal because I said things. Anyway, it was like, it bottled up because he had this daughter who was in my class a couple years before. She had this major conversion to being a conservative Catholic and like now disagreed with everything her dad believed. And I was like literally just teaching her the catechism and the curriculum. So it's like, you know, so sue me. He probably would have. And um, he accused me of hate speech for saying that I would have done voted for Donald Trump. That was hate speech. <laughs> no. And I'm like, we're in Canada. I can't yeah, I was going to say, you're in Canada. Who cares? <laughs> but, I, you know, I said, like, if students would ask me, like, about the election and stuff, I wouldn't, like, give them, like, political things. I would just say, like, I'm a pro-life. I'm a Catholic. Hillary Clinton, like, literally kills her opponents. What do you think she's going to do to babies? I wouldn't actually say that. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I would just say, like, I'm a Catholic. Like, I'm pro-life. Um, yeah, I'm a Canadian. That's funny. Um, but I was just, you know, it was like, of course I'm, 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 you know, I'm pro-life. I, I would vote for Trump hypothetically if I was, if I was in a position anyway, it doesn't matter. So that was that. Anyway, this kid though, 
um, you know, he went home and told his parents that like he basically he was like having psychological problems because he thought he was going to go to hell. And I got in this email, this all this stuff. And I was like, buddy, why didn't you baptize your kid? Like, why are you so upset right now? All I did was teach him the theology of baptism. And you're mad at me because your kid thinks he's going to hell. Like, that's a you problem, not a me problem. Yeah, why and, is your kid in a Catholic? Is, so let me answer something. Catholic schools yeah. in Canada, are they, like, are people going there knowing their kid will get a Catholic education? Or is it yes. a public school, basically? No, like, they have to, so you, uh, you don't have to be baptized to go anymore. You never really no, did for No, of course high not. School. You never needed to. Yeah, Catholic No, you did here. You did. Oh, you, you did. did? Yes. You had to be baptized to go to every elementary school. Uh, up until about 10 years ago, and you didn't have to be baptized for high school uh, ever, I don't think. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, but uh, you do get an education. You'd have to take religion every year, four credits, one credit each year. Um, and in grade 11, you teach world religions, which basically is where they teach everyone that Hinduism is better than Catholicism. When I taught world religions, I just used it to show that they were all heresies. Uh, it was pretty fun. But... Um, so it got to the point, so many things like this would happen to me. Colleagues would turn on me. I ended up getting like anonymous letters in my mailbox in the staff room saying that I would raise my children to be bad people. Uh, it was really, really crazy what stuff. What year is it? This is 2020? So that, that letter started in 2016. Um, I started teaching in 2014, got to the high school in 2015, started a rugby program from scratch, took the kids to like the equivalent of state within like two years, won all the championships, like literally coach like three teams at a time. I was a high achiever, you know, I was always like, that was yeah. one thing too, is people get really jealous when you're like better at stuff. And I was a young guy who was just, you know, kids loved me. It was, was of course they did. I was the coach. I was young, whatever. Like I had a growing family. I wasn't an old stick in the mud. So like high school kids are just going to naturally gravitate towards you. It's just normal. And, um, plus the, plus the sports and whatever. So, um, I used to give up all my lunch time to like do like a Latin club like a couple times a week just for like for no reason. I would, you know, yeah. I, I I never took a break. I was always working hard and people just got upset because it's a unionized job, you know, the way they go. And um, anyway, just crazy betrayals, like crazy stuff, betrayals of people um, to the point where by the time I was, I was actually expecting that at some point I was going to have to leave because I'll just tell you another story. This was a big red pill moment for me. When I had discovered traditionalism, everyone has their gateway drug into being a trad. Yeah. For some people, it's a liturgy. For me, first and foremost, it wasn't actually the liturgy. Um, the Novus Ordo Parish that I went to, it to me now, it's like an abomination. It's like girl altar boys and stuff. But it wasn't a clown mass. Like, there was no... Like it was really just a run of the mill boomer parish. There was I think I think most people don't realize that I mean, because when we talk about it, like I think most people think they have a reverend Novus Ordo, but your typical run of the mill boomer parish has so much nonsense at it that you don't even realize how much your theology is getting thrown off just by being there, you know. So yeah. I, I know it's such a contentious subject but i mean i know my theology was messed up from from going to it and i didn't it wasn't corrected until i started going to the traditional mass yeah yeah it wasn't like again it's one of those things it's like well it's the red pill it's like that movie you know those guys took too many yeah. pills and ended up taking hormone blockers uh the guys who made the film but um you got you know they're trannies right the guys yeah, who made yeah, that yeah. movie, yeah, they yeah. they went too deep in the rabbit hole. <laughs> what, what was the white rabbit in the Matrix? They I heard they slept far. in their parents' bed until they were toddlers. <laughs> I'm kidding, Rob. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm only kidding. I was just thinking between mentioning Hillary and then saying that word, Kennedy's nerfed this dream completely. <laughs> yeah, dude, we don't even have locals anymore. We ran out of our local shows. I'm sorry, guys. I had I've, to I've never had a, mood a little. I've bit. never had a strike. I've never had a strike. Um, we'll so, just get uh, your first one for you. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're never coming on my channel. Um, so, um, wait, wait, but, wait. I gotta, I gotta. Yeah. Carol, we're not, we're not addressing like every single boomer. It's just, it's kind of like um, just because ninety five percent. No, it's. Just, I mean, we have a lot of people who are older that watch our show, and they get really offended when we say boomer. But we're not talking. Like, look, if you're watching our show, you're not the boomer we're talking about. I'm Listen, sorry, baby boomer not. is just a, it's just a literal term that was applied to a generation. It's like a generation, the history books yeah. I used to teach the kids. A you generation know, I'm, I'm, that 
clearly has had problems. I mean, let's be honest. We can be yeah, honest about that, right, everyone? <laughs> yeah, I think, but I think every subsequent generation has had problems too. Oh, 100%. I mean, I think, yeah, you know, like I think every, I think you could say a million things about the millennials. You could say a million mm-hmm. things about Gen Z. They're all, look, we all have our issues. We just happen to, we as millennials blame boomers a lot because our parents are not really Gen Z. My, my, my parents are boomers. I'm like very early millennials. So, yeah. Well, it was a boomer parish uh, in the technical sense, meaning the vast majority of people there were born between like the end of the Second World War in 1968 or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it wasn't cr- like, again, now I look back and I'm like, I can't even believe I ever went to that. But at the time, like there was no liturgical dance. There wasn't like a, a there was no Pachamama. Like it wasn't insane, but it's just girl altar boys weird Eucharistic minister. There's like 13 of them on the altar, all putting the hand sanitizer on and all like just stuff that now I just go, my goodness gracious, I can't even believe like I even was ever there. Um, But the gateway drug for me to traditionalism was creationism. Um, I remember, you know, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, the, no, the, the, he's a, he's black guy. He's like done like, uh, with uh, Monsignor Pope and, um, yeah. Yeah. The third one, I forget. Uh, yeah, he's done many men's conferences, and I was at a men's conference of his, uh, on my 20, 17, 16, 17, 17. Uh, he was in London, Ontario, which, which is where the conference was, which is, which is, I don't live there, but that's where I grew up. And um, I was never a committed evolutionist. Um, I was never a committed evolutionist. I don't know. It just... I'm, so gl- I'm so glad you're talking about this, though, because... Uh, I'm, I'm going to sidetrack your story for a minute, though, because the the evolution thing, like what what I remember the other day, we were we were talking, and you were like, I, I have a hard time with certain modernists that accept evolution. Like we won't say names, but you were like, I just I don't know. I, I have a very hard time because they're 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 denying defeat a statements if they uh, ascribe to evolution. Well, ultimately, I mean. Well, they would say they're not. They're, they have to redefine words in order not to deny them. Uh, they have to say that the only thing that counts as the person is the human soul. Yeah. Which I don't know how they get around that because the soul is the form of the body. Um, well, well, my, so I, my, I po- my point that. is my point is that uh, okay, so being raised in your typical Novus Ordo parish in a very Catholic family, but under the JP two pontificate. Like I was raised to believe in evolution as a Catholic. And yeah, I was always yeah. told Catholics don't deny evolution. Cat, Like that is actually what I was taught by my Catholic catechist. Right. And it isn't until Rob and I have on uh, Hugh, Hugh Owen, Owen. Yeah. that like my paradigm shift happens. Right. So I think there's got to be a way to start having these conversations about this with people where it's not just accusing them of being heretics and modernists, because I really do think the case for creation is a very strong case, you know, and, and the, and the case for evolution is very flimsy. There is no case for it. It's a monster movie, right? It's, um, it's flimsy. It's well, yeah, but so I'm actually, I'm just talking to Hugh Owen today and I'm organizing with him a seven part series will record in the new year release like one every couple weeks or once a month. I'll work it out, whatever I can do. And we're going to tackle seven different topics from top to bottom about evolution, uh, everything from what does the church actually teach about origins historically? Uh, what about the age of the earth? What about the global flood? What about theistic evolution? What about the lack of hominids that are actually found? We're going to go deep on everything. Yeah. Um, and we'll probably have hour and a half conversations about everything, and then it'll be a, a full series. Yeah, because I, I, ironically, it was uh, Graham Hancock that started my process of saying, "Okay, wait, all the things I've been taught are nonsense." <laughs> like, like yeah, him, I know what you mean. <laughs> I mean, it was just to- he's not right. Obviously, he's you know completely wrong. But just that whole idea that oh wait, these people lie. Like this, <laughs> yes, this, we're dealing with liars. Like the you know yes. So. Well, that was my big red pill is I remember I was like, this is ridiculous. Um, and I was at that conference with Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and he was going on and on about like Adam and Eve as part of his thing. And it kind of hit me as I'm there. And I was looking around and I'm like, how many of these men here actually believe Adam was a real person? And I was like, I bet you most of them don't. Yeah. Because um, that is the logical conclusion of the theistic evolutionary thing. It's like, 
Adam's like the offspring of a of a hominid. Like Adam is an ape, and then he's made a pure a person. Adam is Adam is is a is a human being without a soul, which is impossible, um, in the sense of being born. Um, he would be born as a human without a soul, and then he would have a soul infused. That's a that's a zombie apocalypse. That's a monster film. That's not Catholicism. That's disgusting. It's awful. It's evil. I can't even believe people believe that. It makes me it gives me tri- it gives me shivers. It's like what is this? De- this is a demonic creation myth. This is this is like a Mesopotamian, you know, Marta going down into the depths and using pieces of a god to put together a person like this is just hindu hindu pantheism it's like making ganesh or that elephant god with the whatever it's actually ironically it's the same origin story as like well it's one of, it's similar to the origin story of the pachamama um the pachamama has uh, no there's pachamama and pachacapa which are the parents of like this other demon um that the vice president of colombia worships or whatever and it's basically the same as one of those hindu creation myths where like they cut pieces up of the one and they attach it to their kid's head and they make it whatever. And like, that's what evolution is. It's just a demonic pantheistic myth. But in any case, I was really passionate about that. Cause I was like, well, we can't teach our students this nonsense. So there was a point when uh, it came across my desk as part of the religion department, there was this new, not curriculum, but you know, education is politics. So everyone has to pretend they're useful in order to get a promotion. So they always have to create like new things that don't matter, but pretend they matter because they have to get the promotion to do so. So it was one of those things. It was like, oh, so-and-so put together a team and they use their $12,000 budget out of the whatever grant that can't be used to actually teach the kids, but has to be used to do things no one cares about. And they put together this new curriculum resource document, blah, 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 about science and the Catholic faith. And I'm sitting at this staff meeting, reading it. I only got through the evolution part. It was like, you know, this thick and whatever. But the first part was about evolution. And I saw errors in it, like doctrinal errors. I saw there was cut cut and paste of Pope John Paul II quotes where they took out like a sentence in the middle of the quotation and didn't do the dot, dot, dot thing, which is like, that's like academic fraud. Yeah. Um, that's like if you were a journalist, if, you're, if your news agency has a nonprofit status and gets caught doing that continuously, like you'll lose your nonprofit status. Like that's, it's illegal essentially. Um, so... Anyway, I wrote a 35 page reply because what else would you do? And I gave that to uh, the chaplain of the school who was a, not a chaplain, but a layman who worked with the diocese. And, uh, and I said to him, you know, this is wrong. This is heresy. The first thing he said was, well, Kennedy, the Catholic church has to get with the times. And then I showed him from um, Pope Pius IX syllabus of errors that that's a heresy to say that. <laughs> and then he looked at me and he said, oh, you make, you give me a big headache here. That was all. It was like the yeah. Catholic Church has to get, and this guy had the ear of the bishop. He was like, was in, was in the chancery office for decades. And um, so I just, that was when I put myself on the radar. I didn't even know what I was doing. I had no idea about the politics. I'm just like a religion teacher who coaches rugby, has a couple kids and doesn't want to teach children's heresy because I want them to go to heaven. Like that was my whole world. That was all I was thinking. And now, then were now you I- doing fi- the show with Tim yet? No, no, no. This is before that. And, and now I found myself in this place where all of a sudden I'm like, I stepped in it. I didn't even know that I was stepping in it because I didn't know what the heck there was to step in. So now I'm ticking off the chancery office and I'm on their radar and blah, 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 blah. And then um, that was, caused a cascade. There was one employee who helped make the document who worked for the board office. I won't say his name, but it was so shameful. I had to block him on social media. So he made a fake account to troll me and I knew it was him because of how absurd his trolling was that I called him out. Let's just call him Jimmy. It's not Jimmy. Let's call him Kim Naples. And um, <laughs> so I uh, I said, hey, Kim, Kim Naples, that's you, eh? He comes to me the next day at work, like shaking and he apologized. But I was like, this is insane. Like you're making, you're a grown man and you love evolution so much. You don't even go to, he doesn't even go to mass. Like he doesn't even go to mass all the time. And you're making a curriculum document. You're not even leaving a state of grace because you've missed Sunday yeah. obligation. Like, like that's subjectively the case. And you're making a social media account to troll me about evolution. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, what happened to you? You know what I'm saying? Like, I was just like, this yeah. is crazy. Him and a bunch of other guys ended up stabbing me in the back and whatever. And so that stuff just was constant. And it was at a point where I uh, would talk to my wife and I was like, I, I can't do this forever. I can't do it forever. I wanted to. Teaching in Ontario is the golden job. It's the, it's the golden goose. 
you make $100,000 a year and you get a pension when you're 55 and you get summers off and you get two weeks at Christmas. It's like you can't ask for a better job. Um, so like I was trying to do everything I could not to leave it. And, uh, but I just realized that either, and Father Sherry of the SSPX, he's a district superior. He's going to England now to be the superior there at the end of the year. And he had a meeting with my wife and she was telling him about this. And he said, Kennedy's going to have to leave. Um, and one big thing was the pension. I didn't get to take my pension with me because I wasn't there for 10 years. I got to take like a little bit of it. Yeah. Yeah. I got to take a little bit, but nothing. And, but I was like, I can't do this forever. And and Father Sherry said, you're just going to have to let these things go uh, because you'll either burn out or you'll compromise. And it's like, I'm not going to compromise because I'm not a heretic, but I'm also not going to, I don't want to become an alcoholic. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to. What year did you finally uh, break it off there? So we were all sent home in 2020. And then I put my book out May 1st, 2020. And through the friendship with Tim Flanders, connection to Tiller Marshall, God on Marshall's show, and the book sort of took off. That was a good time because everyone was at home. So Amazon, it was like YouTube exploded. Like Amazon sales were like, they've never seen them for obviously. So, and people just had time to do stuff. So people were reading things. So that was really helpful. People were reading uh, things. People are watching YouTube. It was so much drama going on in the church at the time because Francis was behind all this stuff. So it was like anybody that was talking about the controversy just got this this boom. Like we came in at the tail end of that where the yeah. my channel i started in 2021 once the jab came out you know we like that was the the drop off i think we caught we came in at the tail end if we would have started a year earlier i think we'd have been much better off could be yeah um yeah my numbers with fatima center were pretty big when i was in 2020 2021 with them but uh, that wasn't my own channel so yeah. but um in any case though uh i decided I finished the year, like I finished till June online. It was a joke, like we did nothing. Um, it was such a it was such a joke. I can't believe people got paid for that. But um, we did nothing. And then I decided to take a leave of absence uh, for September. The book sales were decent enough. And I was like, as long as I put together a couple other things, we'll be fine. So I did, and I, you know, trust God and all that, you know. And uh, then I, th- I took that year, and then I got a job at LifeSite News in 2021. Um, and so it took another year of leave of absence. And the reason why I didn't resign was just because you don't have to resign. Like you can take yeah. a leave of absence forever. And I was like, I don't know, like just, I spent however many thousands of dollars getting a degree. I got this license for whatever I put in all this time and effort and I got this seniority and stuff. Like if I don't have to get rid of it, like I just won't, like it's not, you know what I mean? It wasn't cost so me. You it was could just technically go back if you wanted. At the time, yeah, I could have, yeah, for sure. They would have had to give me my position. I could end it at any moment. So it was just like, I don't know, like maybe they're going to lift the jab mandate. Uh, yeah. maybe, I mean, we didn't have one for teaching, but maybe they'll just lift it. Maybe things will go back to normal. I didn't know it was going to go back to normal. And I didn't know what was going to happen, you know? So in any case, I finally resigned in 2022 um, just because I was like, I'm obviously never going back. Um, and then I had to deal with that tribunal thing in the fall of 2022, even though I'd resigned. And they told me, the quote from the lady, she had shoulder pads and was in a pantsuit, of course. Um, and um, the quote was, uh, I, I remember recording it to have it on my phone somewhere. And it was, your beliefs supported by Catholic doctrine constituted abuse to your students. It's insane. And I was teaching Catholic school. And it wasn't even from the classroom. It was from stuff in my books. And the one thing was that I said male and female, This is this was one quote. You said male and female are a perfection, thereby negating that there are other perfect genders. Wow. See, like everybody in the comments <laughs> is saying homeschool, homeschool, homeschool. But did you see that story of that 15-year-old kid that was homeschooled that the FBI like lured him into a group chat? Is it better uh, than the no. kid that just murdered someone at the public school? Oh no no no! I'm saying I'm saying there's still, of course, homeschool your kids. Yeah, so I'm not saying that. I'm saying that this. I, I was just trying to segue, Rob. The, uh, um, there was a there's a 15 year old kid. All right, so we'll, let's finish your story first, then I'll, then we'll go into that story. Um, so all right, so you had to face that tribunal. What winds up happening with that? It was just all symbolic because I'd already resigned, but um, 
because when I like got hired, I signed something, blah, 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 because it happened while I was still under the College of Teachers by law, I had to sit through the slap on the wrist, which would amount to nothing. But what ended up, they said, if you ever want to teach again, then you have to do three months of unpaid leave or unpaid teaching and do re-education. Um, or that was it pretty much. So uh, that was what happened. That was the fall 2022. Never looked back. Um, so yeah, as I said, I never did get, never did to go fund me, go fund me because I was just able to not have to, and I, I never would, would want to do that. I'm not saying you shouldn't if you have to, but I just didn't want to do that sort of thing. Didn't want any of that pressure. But throughout all that time, as you can imagine, lots of stabs in the back, lots of betrayals, lots of stuff. I ended up getting really sick at one point uh, from all the pressure on the family. There was stuff like in this in the town I lived in. We ended up moving, um, not just for that reason, but we wanted to get to the country. But there was like stuff going around and Facebook groups for like the whole town of like 30,000 people. These groups had like 30,000 people for, you know, the whatever town it was and, and, you know, petitioning to get this guy fired, like people that never even knew who I was. It was a whole on like, this was during the time of like George Floyd, where no one had anything better to do, but then just literally tear down statues or tear yeah. down other people. And I was just, I got caught up in that and it was crazy. So it was really, really tough. So that was my experience with uh, education. And then this, that whole experience, what was also tied into it was at that point, I came out of the SSPX closet. And while I was being canceled by the school system, I was also being canceled by all these friends I had um, who started calling me schismatic and whatever. And Wait, um, who, like, were there any, anybody notable that we know or is it? No, no, not, no, like no, it's not private like, life. It's, it's private regular life people. Stuff. Regular. Private life. Okay. Um, yeah. And um, I was also dropped. I was going to be full disclosure, like I was, they were trying to get me to join Opus Day really hard. And, um, and I considered it in like 2018 or so. By the time I like became fully traditional, like I wasn't going to do it, not because of any conspiracy reasons, but just because the Opus Day like Novus Ordo was pretty hard. So I'm just like, I'm not going to do that. Um, I know that they're orthodox in many ways. I know there's a great rule of life. I'm not saying it's a, you know, Dan Brown conspiracy. I'm just saying I had decided it wasn't for me, even though at a yeah. time I was like, in the Novus Ordo, it seems pretty good. You know, it's quiet, meditation, adoration, the recollections, all these kinds of things. That's a pretty good deal when you've got, you know, your your clown mask going on. It seems like it seems like paradise. So um, I was scheduled to be a men's conference speaker. The first talk was going to be in 2020 in the spring. And then I was going to do this other one out west. And it was just like I was going to be turned into this like, you know. Uh, it was, Catholic it's circuit. Very, Catholic it was, I was going to be on the speaker. Catholic circuit because yeah. everyone knows, you know, conspiracies aside, if you get in with Opus Dei, like they're connected monetarily to everybody. So it was like, that was going to be my thing. Boom. SSPX dropped yeah, like but a dude, hot let potato. Me let me tell you something. The, the Catholic speaker circuit imploded with Francis. It really yeah. did. Like, like you got to really think, um, like when, what year did you convert? Like, well, I re, like revert, I guess. Revert, uh, like your your original reversion when you went down to Mexico and you, 20, and you early twenty fifteen, early twenty fifteen. So, okay, so you you were you're you're two years into the Francis Pontificate at that point. Now, yeah. Before Francis, during the Benedict Pontificate, bro, like the Catholic speaker circuit, you talking like that's back when Taylor Marshall was yep. on it, Scott yep. Hunt, like there was a real tight knit community of guys they all knew each other they all would go on the journey home francis comes along and that i think that stuck around until until 2017 like because when i talked to taylor about it he was like yeah he goes i started losing speaking gigs in 2017 then was that once morris letizia yeah morris letizia really like that's when people started going, wait, I'm uneasy about this. And people were still in the, no, 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 he's the Pope. We got to defend the Pope no matter what. But I mean, we're in such a different landscape now than we were even three years ago. Well, I mean, I never thought in a million years I'd be speaking at a conference with Janet Smith, Doug Barry, and I never thought Jesse I'd be Romero speaking at a conference with anybody. General. So, But I, but I remember <laughs> like, I'm just like, I'm literally in schism, according to all these people. And I'm at a conference with like Doug Barry. He was on yeah. EWTN, like doing a teenager show like 15 minutes ago, you know? Now I know he's kind of gone further to the right, but the point is, is, is it's just funny how that worked out. Janet Smith is like 
you know, Chris Ferrara and Great Facade called her a neo-Catholic luminary back in the early 2000s. And in fairness, she's, she's admittedly changed a ton. But it's just, it's crazy how things have happened like that. Um, but as I, as that all was happening, I was, um, I was getting canceled by everybody. And it was, and, and what I realized too, to go back to the evolutionary thing, the conservative Catholics, like the Catholic answer fanboy types, and the liberals both called me an idiot for it, metaphorically. And I was like, this is insane. This is like when, yeah. this is like when the, the, the where Peter is and the church militant people shake hands to go after the SSPX. It's like, you have no scruples. You have no scruples. You know what I mean? Like, well, here, all right. So this is uh, kind of why I named the, the episode this is because it, we're in this weird time, right? Like I'm, I'm still trying to figure out, um, like I want to have conversations with everybody. I had Trent Horn on a few months back and I kind of had a decent conversation with him. And then right after that conversation, he came out with the video about you and Taylor. And I was like, oh, come on, man. Like, we just, you know, we're, I'm trying to, like, I've been trying to lower the temperature in the room a bit with everyone except my co-host, apparently. But um, I I figured, let me try and talk to as many people as I can. And then that video comes out that me and you were talking after the show I did about Lofton because we saw all the other Catholic commentators in here. Like, I want to see what common ground we can find because you were at a conference speaking with Janet Smith and Doug Barry, and we were all friendly with each other. Like there was no, yeah, but those people will never be, those people will never be in with Catholic Inc. Now it won't happen. You think this is one, you think they're no, out? It will never happen. They're out for sure. This is one thing. This is what I realized. Okay. This is why this all ties together. Why do, why, why I realized there were so many teachers who believed what I believed not so many, but let's say 20% of the staff who yeah. were legitimately conservative, had no time for gender dysphoria nonsense, had no time for, you know, rainbow flags on the Catholic schools. Like they were, they were good old sane Catholics, but they would never say anything about it. Why? Because they're 25 years into a job. They got five years to retirement. Yeah. They don't the love of the boat. The lo well, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's, that's just, it's, it's, it's one of those truths that we just have to go back to over and over and over again. If you attach your religion to your wallet, you will apostatize. Yeah. There's no way around it. At, at best, you will turn your back on people and compromise. And we won't say these stories on air, Anthony, please. But you know I've talked to you about things. There are things I've gone through with folks that are part of Catholic Inc. And I'm like, this is someone who, you know, these are people who seem like they're traditional, leaning, whatever. And then my dealings with them, it's like, you're no different than the communists I met when the school system. Yeah. And why is that? Why is that? It's because, well, there's a, this is what I said on that podcast I did about um, the dark side of Catholic media. If your paycheck is attacked, not, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do things as a, like, I'm not saying it's wrong to get paid to doc, talk about or write about religion. That's absurd. I, I make my living that way. Yeah. But... But there's, a, but there's this, it's kind of like that, you know, that old, that, that, that quote from that judge when they decided about obscenity laws, what's the difference between a nude and a nude thing and like a fresco versus a pornographic image. And it's like, there's a line that's crossed and everyone just knows it when they see it, but you can't describe yeah. it. You know, when it comes to like, there's a way to make a living in that you produce things that are helpful to Catholics or are part of Catholic scholarship. And then there's a way to make a living being a Catholic guy. Those are not the same thing. Like Taylor Marshall, it, we, he'll tell you this. If his YouTube channel goes away tomorrow, it doesn't matter. It's not how he makes his living. Oh no, he's got he's got his books, the uh, new uh, New St. Thomas Institute. Yeah, right. YouTube is kind of just like a platform where he gets to voice his opinions and stuff. That's not where he's making his bread. Anymore. Obviously, it's helpful. Like it yeah. helps you sell books and stuff like that. But that he didn't do it to make money. He, he started doing YouTube videos when he was a professor at John Fisher College yeah. or whatever it was, just to like catechize because he loves Jesus Christ and wants people to go to heaven. Yeah. That was the only, you know, obviously it's, it's exploded with the Pope Benedict resigning video and that's fine. You know, um, for myself, when I started doing videos, I had a job as a Catholic school teacher. I never once in a million years thought that I would be a professional Catholic. What I thought would happen, and I maybe I was thinking long term was like, oh, I'll, I'll get to speak at some conferences because I've got in this in with Opus Dei. 
And then like, that'll be fun. And like, maybe one day I'll write a book and like, I'll maybe one day, like in 20 years, like I'll do like a half teaching load to like do some, like a PhD or something. And maybe one day I'd be a professor. Like that was what I thought I would do. That was literally all I thought about. Um, but what you see in this Catholic media thing is like, listen, look at, look at what these people are contributing. If, if somebody is dependent on being relevant in order to make a living, it doesn't matter if they're trying to be relevant as a Catholic. They're no different than an Instagram influencer as yeah. far as how they make their money. Yeah, I think it's Versus, always dangerous when you wind up audience captured too, right? Like you're afraid to say something you believe because you don't want to upset your audience. That's right. Or your co-host. I'm not afraid of that at all. I literally said I would rather die than attend, the, bro, than participate in the Nova Sorrow. you're right, bro. What? Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> you want you want me to Just finish this up? Chat. You want me to finish this up, man? No, was, I'm good. Like not even a chuckle out of you. All right, nothing. Um, um, yeah, it's like when you get audience capture where you're where you're afraid to speak your mind because you don't want to offend your audience. I think that's a dangerous place to be. Also, here's the and here's the dark side that comes in. If your living is made of being the most relevant person in the space, then you can't tolerate other people taking people away from that space. Yeah. And that's what we see. This is what we see. And I realized, I realized that early on, I realized that before I was a traditional, a, pro a professional Catholic, so to speak, I realized that when I was teaching and it, ha and it wasn't about money at that point, it was about influence. They were all happy. The conservatives in the diocese, you know, were like, oh, good for you, Kennedy. Fight for that pro-life, you know, be that guy. Yeah, this is awesome. And then I was like, hey, evolution is probably a heresy. They're like, well, you're a fundamentalist. We're not, that's not Catholic. And uh, what, are the, what are the liberals waving the rainbow flags? They don't believe in evolution either. Let's go have a beer with them, you know? And um, that's what I realized. And I said, okay, if you're attached, basically it's like if you're attached to a certain type of Catholicism, and that's another thing too. The, the if non-traditional Catholicism has no identity, what is it? What is what is non-traditional Catholicism? Well, I'm a Reverend Novus Ordo guy. What is that? That's not a thing. Well, I'm a you know I'm a JP two guy. That's not an identity. I don't identify with the Pope as a type of Catholic guy. I'm I'm a Pius the tenth guy. Well, I kind of am, but that's like not the point. You know, um, it, it's like I'm just a tradition. I'm a I'm an Orthodox Roman Catholic who believes all of the things I have to believe and will never accept something that I don't have to believe or I shouldn't believe, and I will never participate in a liturgy that I know goes against how literally all of my ancestors worshiped because I know the will of God is manifest in the lasting traditions in the church. And I'm not gonna go against the 20th century will of God. It's very simple. My identity is very clear, but these people out there who have these professional Catholic grifts, essentially, they have to find a way for themselves to be relevant. And this is why they get so Protestant with things. Like, look at some of these videos from some of these professional Catholics. It's absurd. I'm like, are you trying to sell me a used car or catechize? It's like, it's like they're doing a Tony Robbins thing while they're, they're standing, walking back and forth with a microphone in front of a, in front of a tabernacle, for goodness sakes, because that's what you do in a Nova Soto parish. And I'm like, do you think this is Catholicism? But guess what? That was $5,000. That was $5,000. Are you going to give and up five thousand dollars? It really $5, is so weird that there uh, that you. I mean, that's a very good point. That there's, there's, there's the Catholic. That's why I really do like the the remnant naming the Catholic Identity Conference that because there's something about the last couple of years of just whittling down the identity of being Catholic, where we are pretty much at this point no different from any mainline liberal protestant sect if you're following this synodal church right so yes. i mean we you have to make a stand somewhere because I, I i watched a video somebody told me to watch in my comments by uh this this uh this girl the black catholic chick and she was the video was about how toxic catholic youtube is and she just wants to help catechize people and she's like you know i'm starting to see in my parish i'm starting to see more women are starting to veil now i'm starting to see more people receiving on the tongue kneeling for communion and i'm like but like you should just come to the latin mass because like all those things are inherent there you know and all the things that people that say they go to a reverend novus ordo brag about 
the things that you're bragging about are inherent in this other liturgy. Now, I know not everybody has access to it, um, but there is something there is something about your Catholic identity when you go the traditional route where you you do feel like you're reclaiming that Catholic identity, that real Catholic identity that existed for thousands of years, but that seems to be just getting whittled down to nothing these days. This is the false dilemma. This is the false dichotomy. This this is why, okay. This is this is this is proof that I don't care about being a professional Catholic on YouTube. And it's something that if it goes away tomorrow, I'll just record more audiobooks and I'll just write more books. I'll have more time on my hands, to be honest. <laughs> well, I don't have a I don't have a good audio voice, so you better not get me in trouble. Well, you got you got a day job. Listen, Let's go. <laughs> it's no different than communism, what happened with the Second Vatican Council and after. And here's what we might mean by that. It's what the Democrats do. You tell a lie so big that it's irrefutable. This is from Stalin, right? You make a narrative that is so absurd and so big and is impenetrable because who would ever say such a thing? Yeah. It must be true. So this idea that traditional Catholicism is divisive, it's one of these examples. It's like when somebody calls you a racist. You have two things. One, you can defend yourself. And if you do, you've lost. Two, you can say, actually, you're a racist and go to hell. And that's how you win. And people don't want to do that. Um, traditional Catholicism is not divisive. You know why? Because traditional Catholicism isn't traditional Catholicism. That's like traditional Catholicism is Catholicism. So if somebody says to me, oh, there's division at my parish because there's traditional Catholics. No, there's division at your parish because there's communism. There's division there's at your parish. Catholics. There's division at your parish because there is heresy. That's why it's divided. Traditional Catholicism is not divisive. Well, quote primum is very divisive. You really going to say that? Pope Leo XIII is very divisive. That's your hill you want to die on? There, there is no division in traditional Catholicism. It's just Catholicism. Everything else is a mockery. Yeah, I, I don't think there. All right. So, what does the church? look like going forward it's it's i don't see how there can be any unity when they're watering down the truth and that's what just continuously has been happening for the past 70 years since the council right they just keep watering down the truth watering down the truth now we're also left in this strange place in traditional land where it's it's like okay the, we need the Pope. I mean, the, the papacy is a very big thing here. So, I mean, you saw Scott Hahn backpedaling on his statement, you know, because that's true. The, the, the Pope is the head of the visible church on earth. So, you know, <laughs> I didn't know about that. Yeah. Scott Hahn released a statement today saying, um, or maybe yesterday, correcting what he's er, that because earlier he said it's heresy to say the pope is the head of the church but that's not it's it's actually accurate to say the pope is the head of the church he's the head of the visible church he's the head of the church on earth so we, we're always confronted with this problem of what do we do during this pontificate so i mean Ra man I, I don't know if i should say this uh people keep bouncing around the question what what are the chances a future Pope says this past decade were just. <laughs> this oh, like if, if it was said of a contest. Well, I don't know because it, look, people do have a, a valid point. When you say set of a contest, you mean very specifically a 58. Okay. Uh, what, you know, some version of contest. some version. Yeah. Of some an, version of set of a contest where, where maybe Francis is an anti-Pope or something like that. You know, if somebody came out tomorrow and said, if, if Pope Francis died, God save his soul, and there was a council convened after a conclave, and then Pope Leo XIII ascended to the throne, put the tiara on, and said, Pope Francis is an anti-pope, I'd say, so the sun also rose this morning is what you're saying as well. Like, I'm not surprised by this information. Um, I'm not going to say that I believe that to be the case right now. I don't actually believe that there is no pope. I don't believe that. Yeah. I've looked into the state of a contest literature. I correspond with a fellow who's a state of a contest who's very smart, and not like Brother Diamond in your face, like it's no, not like WM that at all. Review, right? Yeah, he's wonderful, yeah, and like uh, we too. talk we talk all the time, like you know, messaging and stuff. He's a great guy, and the arguments are very convincing. And then I read things against it, and they're also very convincing. So this just tells me, okay, it has to be defined one day. 
Yeah. And it's not. So I, so I'm not going to do anything about it. What, what am I going to do about it? Right? Like, it, and then I don't mean the quietism thing of, well, then just do everything the Pope says. No, I'm just going to use my reason. If yeah. he's the Pope, then he has the, the jurisdiction over everything. But his office is there to build up and not to tear down. This is in Vatican I. Even Vatican I talks about true obedience. Why would it say true obedience rather than just obedience? Because obedience is a virtue. And if it's false obedience, it's a vice. So you could never, it, you, it would never be Catholic of you to do something vicious, which is what it means to do a vice. It would never be, it would never be Catholic to do something that is vicious in order to honor the Pope or follow him or obey him because that would just be, okay, so you have to sin in order to, to follow the Pope. It doesn't make any sense. So it has to be true obedience. So I may be wrong when I stand before God. I may be wrong. We may all be wrong. A state of a contest of goodwill may be wrong. Uh, a, a Nova Sordite of goodwill may be wrong. A traditionalist of, of goodwill may be wrong. I don't know. But I'm in a position now where we're, we're sheep without a shepherd, uh, yeah. metaphorically speaking. So I don't really care about that question that much even if it's interesting for some people. So last year you came on, we did our year in review and it was right after the death of Benedict. Mm -hmm. Remember? Like you came on, we did our year in review. Review. We had you and Matt Gaspers on. This year we're going to have Anthony Stein on because your wife's uh, going to be having the baby soon, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're praying for your wife. Um, So right after Benedict passes, we did that show. Now it seems like since Benedict passed, the, the rapidity with which Francis is striking his opponents down. It's like if if they would go after somebody who spoke her heresy as quickly as they went after Strickland, or now they're coming after Burke, if there's any truth to the Burke story. I I, I, I want to see confirmation of that because I feel like that might be another one of those stories where they just no, want to get... It's been corroborated now by, by, sec, by, by several people, sources. Yeah. The Associated yeah. Press even... Yeah. I said All right. So, I mean, if they're, gonna, if they're going after Burke... I mean, Burke is, is a funny character because he originally did that original dubia after a morris uh they got no response and then he kind of went quiet for years and then he just popped up again with this most recent dubia and he's been speaking out and now right away he's getting punished seems like francis is speeding things up the way he's handling things yeah pope francis is going to die soon i think that's what i think he's liquidating it's like going at a business sale um there's um another bishop that's going to be strickland in argentina um yeah it's happening right now bishop uh Luis uh, Bali or whatever his last name is, Balia. Anyway, he's in Argentina. But um, listen, I'll give you a, a story to explain the spirit of this thing. So we have a new chapel. We, we bought our society, St. Pius X Priory, expanded because we just had so many people. Thank you, Pope Francis, and thank you, COVID. <laughs> um, and um, so we opened up a new chapel. We bought an old Protestant church, and we I didn't do much. I'm not very handy, but there's many contractors and construction men and farmers, which is basically the same thing at our parish. And they all just did a ton of work over a few months and it was ready to go. So we had the dedication of the church in October, same as the Our Lady of the Rosary feast day. And um, what happened was, is there was like five priests there. It was incredible, beautiful, amazing, like the greatest thing that's happened in that town in like a hundred years when it comes to Catholicism. It's just like, what an event. The bishop hates us. Um, they send out letters that are literally lies. I've, I've literally talked about what my bishop has said in videos before and shown like this letter is literally false about the SSPX. It says things like you can't go to the SSPX under any circumstances, even if there's no other priests available. I'm like, Ken Law doesn't even say that. <laughs> like, yeah. Ken Law says you could literally go to the Orthodox if there was no other option. That's, in, that's absurd. Um, so I'm not saying you should, I'm just saying that's what it says. And um, so at the end of the, at the end of the like three hour ceremony, right? One of our priests has this beautiful operatic voice. He's like, like has the professional singer caliber voice. And he's in the confessional and I'm at the back, right? And he comes out of the confessional. So there's this, there's this hymn to Pius X that is composed by the SSPX. It's a really good hymn. And we sang it at the end and it was, the choir was on point. It was amazing. The whole church is singing. It's like one of those moments where you're like, your heart feels like it's gonna come out of your chest. It's so beautiful. And he comes out of the confessional because no one else is there. There was like 40 confessions during mass, by the way. And he comes out of the confessional and sings like the final Ora Pro Nobis with this beautiful operatic voice where I heard it and I like lost my breath a bit. Yeah. Because it was just like the cherry on top is like this priest comes out of the confessional after saving souls for three hours. 
and is so joyful for the legacy of Pope Pius X and this new parish that he sings like an angel and adds to this choir like out of nowhere for the finale. Like the significance, the symbolism of it, it floored me. And I remember after this, you know, saying my Thanksgiving after Mass and stuff, and I thought to myself, what is wrong with this diocese that they don't want this? What is wrong with this, with this chancery office that they would ever spend any of their energy saying we don't want this in the diocese? Because I think because, this... I think, I think because it's, it's, it exposes them for what they are. More, it may be, but it's demonic because this is literally Catholicism. It's just strange how much leeway is given to actual schismatics like the Orthodox and how much charity is shown to them. And then people they that are more Catholic than you. I mean, even if they thought there was some canonical issue, it's like, why wouldn't this group be shown a special, a special status over every other? It's a very strange thing, the way that the society gets treated. It's very strange. So after Mass, I go to one of our... One of our the older men, not older, but he's one of the the dads, one of the patriarchs of this community and the parish and the chapel. And uh, I told him the story. And I said, you know, so and so, I just like I I literally I wrote the book as they say, I wrote the book on it. I get it. Like I get the history. I get the arguments. I understand the politics. But just in like I can be an, if I was an illiterate peasant, I would understand this more from just simply being in this chapel and hearing that priest sing and singing that hymn and seeing that dedication, seeing my boys up there on the altar and then com and, and comparing that to the Novus Ordo Parish down the road, which is like, it's, 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 it's just, it's, it's what it is. It's just not good. And, and I say this to this, this friend of mine and he just says, they just don't care about souls and they don't, Yeah, they don't care about souls yeah. and well, they don't believe in so hell. They don't, they don't believe Catholicism yeah. because if you believe Catholicism, you won't do that. You just won't, you won't do that. Actions speak louder than words. If you condemn that, when, by the way, if we're being letter of the law, you don't even have to nowadays because Pope Francis is all giddy for the SSPX. So even if you want to be a liberal, it's in fashion, it's in vogue to be all pro Lefebvre. So you could say you're being thing, merciful. They, they actually don't believe the Catholic faith. A, a significant portion of the hierarchy and clergy do not believe the Catholic faith. And it really is a crapshoot when you go to your average parish, what you're going to get. Because a lot of priests, I mean, I've I've been to so many milquetoast, mediocre homilies where you could just tell they're just giving you some cute little anecdote. They don't even necessarily believe anything there it, it's it's a very strange time to be catholic man listen there's a part in my book and this is a re jp2 red pill about the caring of souls during the negotiations between archbishop lefebvre and cardinal ratzner at one point one of the options on the table was basically do what we ask of you and sign on to the revolution yeah, And we'll make sure that there's no doubt that all of those thousands of marriages that have taken place over the last 15 years are valid. Yeah. I just want people That's... to take a step, stay, take a step back and think about that just for a second here. Yeah. They were willing to let those 15 years worth of marriages burn in hell. Yeah. Cause that's the law that if I'm being honest, I'm a simple man, Anthony, I believe what the catechism of council of Trent tells me, I believe what, you know, I tend to believe Catholicism. Call me crazy. And if you are not in a valid marriage and you're Catholic and you die that way, sin. you go to hell. I mean, yeah. obviously, repent, repent. I'm just saying, if that's how you live and die, unless you repent, you go to hell. So Somebody... is, is it, does, it come, does the salvation of a soul come down to politics? And if at that point I say to myself, I don't know what you believe. That's not a Catholic way to act. And that's, been, that's every level of the church, and it's even in the quote-unquote conservative popes. And until that's done, there's no way that I'm going to be falling in front of these arguments because I'm just going to say, listen, I can't. And, and funny enough, re, I was reading, oh, man, who was I reading? Some of these ancient, one of, one of the times during the Arian crisis. And at that time, 
there were these saints saying, well, these bishops lost their offices because of heresy. <laughs> Like yeah. it was not a, it wasn't even a thing. It was like, well, they don't have any power over you because they're heretics. You obviously don't have to listen to a heretic. So you just wait for the storm to pass and that's all you can do. Yeah, that's it. We're in a storm. I, we, we, uh, we got a homily on uh, Christ asleep in the boat recently, right? Christ yeah. asleep in the boat. Fall asleep, it's, man. That's all you can do. <laughs> it's uh, Christ asleep in the boat and everybody panicking and he get like, ye of little faith. Like, okay. We're in a tumultuous storm right now, and Christ is asleep in the boat. It's a rough time, but you're right. Just got to weather the storm right now, man. It's it's wild. I saw somebody said that um, Burke is very anti-SSPX. Okay, yeah, but so was Schneider a couple of years back. And I think a lot of um, a lot of people are starting to change their tune on it. Like I'm gonna, I want to speak to Patrick Coffin and see if I can have a conversation with him because I really like Patrick Coffin, and I. Um, his position on the SSPX just I, I'm just like, dude, you, what are you what are you so stubborn on this for? Especially being that you hold the position you do. You know, you I, I was <laughs> I want to just because I, I really do like him. I think he's got some freaking he's an amazing interviewer. He's got some amazing he's opinions. He's a very good interviewer. He's a very, very good, good interviewer. interviewer. Yeah. Uh, but his just as it's a weird thing these guys go for. They just they're so dogmatic about their opinion on the SSPX. And it's I just don't see how they don't see. It's. I mean, we're in a really strange time right now, man. You, you you gotta you gotta back off those 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 hard nosed opinions you had 15 years ago because you thought, okay, well, John Paul II said this or Benedict said that. We're we're in we're in we're in uncharted territory at this point. Uncharted territory at this point. It's time to chill chill a little bit. Yeah, we are. But also, again. There's a big difference between someone who's not a liberal and someone who's a traditionalist. Yeah. Like, listen, you don't think Pope Francis is the Pope because of a bad election or something? Well, that's not traditional Catholicism. That's just an opinion about the papacy. You know, it's like there are many Fenites that go to the Novus Ordo, if you can believe it. You know, um, <clears throat> it doesn't mean you're, there are many Fenite orders that have said the Novus Ordo. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not a traditionalist opinion. It's an opinion about the Pope. That is controversial, but it's not traditional Catholicism. And in fact, if you believe traditional Catholicism and read the traditional understanding of the papacy, there's no way you'd come to that conclusion. Because this idea of like an internal reservation about the munis and the ministerium and blah, 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 blah. I never, I never bought arguments. that argument. I well, never bought that I don't, argument. I don't think that's, I don't know which one's, but the point is like you, the Pope is the man, the Bishop of Rome is the Pope and the Bishop of Rome is elected by the priests and the bishops of Rome. <laughs> the, yeah. the, the other of the, the incarnated just means that you have a, a parish in Rome. That's all it means. There's been cardinals since day one in the technical sense. And if they recognize you as a pope, that's literally it. Yeah. So that's not even traditional Catholicism. And that's one of the major problems, too, is this is one of the lies that we've fallen into as traditional Catholics is people associate everything that is non mainstream with traditionalism. That's not the case at all. And another thing, too. <clears throat> A big problem in the traditional Catholic world is the politicization of Catholicism. You don't not you. I, this is not something you will almost ever hear in an SSPX chapel, but you hear it a lot of the time on traditional Catholic sermons on the internet that are from non-SSPX groups. You do not want your your priest preaching consistently and constantly about politics. Yeah. You do not want that. You don't want that. For one, they might be wrong. They don't have any special gift on on political opinions. Secondly, um, it scandalizes children. My kids have never heard a homily where the word, I think maybe one time where the word abortion was used. They didn't know what it was. They've, but, but I've heard the priests many times teach about the ills of the day, and I know they're referencing abortion. Yeah. They've never heard our priests talk about anything to do with the Rainbow Coalition lifestyle. But I know that's exactly what they're talking about. But it's housed in a traditional understanding of human man and woman, virtue, yeah. all these kinds of things. And and that's the thing too is is you know, like uh, you know the canceled priests. I had a really good time at that conference, and um, and like it was wonderful. I hope I get to go back again. That was I hope I see you there again next year, Anthony. It was so much fun. Maybe Rob can take along. 
and uh, keep you in line and 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 get make sure you get back to your room if, after you drink too much. And um, <laughs> everyone, you know, and um, but the point is, is like there was a lot of stuff there. Where I'm like, this is politics. This isn't Catholicism. Like, I get it. Like, you shouldn't be. Father Altman was right. You can't be a Democrat and a Catholic, obviously. But technically speaking, yeah, but like you almost can't be a Republican and a, and a Catholic. I was just going to say, like, we're at a point where where Trump just was talking about, you know, yeah. uh, that about uh, un, unaliving children up to six. It's just we're in such a, a, a terrible time for politics that it just seems like everything's coming down all at once. Like even the even the whole situation with the the riots in Ireland, um, there are twenty five hundred cops in New York just uh just quit yeah. you have these migrant uh facilities being built in chicago they have open borders pouring in same things happening in canada it seems like they are intentionally trying to collapse everything and then you have so society around us they're just flooding in the open immigration is about destroying culture and what unites a people so if they could get everything in the culture to collapse, but at the same time you have this whole thing in the church, seems like that's collapsing too. It just seems like everything's happening all at once right now, which is why I think people are just so worried. You know, it's it's a it's a lot to handle all at once. I, I think a lot of us thought, okay, we'll suffer persecution, but it'll come from outside the church. None of us thought the persecution would come from within like this. Yeah, yeah. I mean. And in a time like this, when things are so crazy, um, <clears throat> belly aching about Democrats. And again, there's a time and a place for everything. But I'm just saying, as a general principle, belly aching about Democrats from the pulpit. What are you going to do? I mean, what's that yeah. going to help your parishioners? Like, okay, the Democrats are bad. Yeah, no kidding. I heard, you know, again, yeah, if the you sun form rose this people morning. in the Catholic faith properly, they're not going to vote for evil. That's right. That's you know, right. if you just yeah. preach Catholicism and challenge people in their spiritual life, they won't vote for evil. I mean, it's as simple as that, right? Like you said, your priest will give homilies on things abstractly where you know the implications of it. Yeah, yeah. I want to address this one comment. Maybe you can pull up, uh, Rob, the Which prepping one? for heaven person. If the SSPX is legit, why isn't the Orthodox Church legit? This must be a fake Lofton account. Um, neither of them see the Pope as a legitimate leader of the church. If you ask the, most SSPX if they follow the Pope, see what they tell you. Let's break that down. If you ask most SSPX, so you got to be use your words carefully here because you're going to fall into calumny and detraction. So you got to be careful about doing mortal sins on the internet. Doesn't uh, you don't get out of it just because you're anonymous, by the way. So most of the SSPX, you mean at, does that mean you asked the 700 priests <clears throat> because those are the people who are in the SSPX? What about the 450 nuns or so? Have you asked them? What about the million or so people that attend the SSPX sacraments worldwide on a weekly basis? Is that what you mean by asking most? So if you're going to say most of the SSPX doesn't see the Pope as legitimate, I'd like you to show me the evidence of where you've talked to almost a million people and have the records for that. Otherwise, you've just told a lie. Secondly, if you pick up an Angelus Press hymnal, you will find in the benediction service the name Francis Franciscus is printed in Latin because we pray for him and sing his name in Latin. And they printed new hymnals when he was elected Pope in order to show their uh, understanding that he is the Pope. Furthermore, they recognize the Pope as Pope in the Mass every time, and obviously they've had faculties as recognized by the Pope and go to Rome whenever they're asked. Um, also, yeah. I was just talking to a priest who was talking to another priest who was part of the doctrinal discussions in Rome, and um, Pope Francis uh, actually told the group that he read Archbishop Lefebvre's biography twice, and he said after the second time he finally understood the state of necessity. Um, uh, there are, you will find no one on earth who prays for the Pope more than a traditional Catholic, especially one in the SSPX. So um, why is the Orthodox, Orthodox Church not legit? Because they don't fit any of those descriptions. But also what he's saying is if you ask uh, your average person going to the SSPX and you'll get a different answer, but you have to realize the church has set <clears throat> standards and guidelines for when it's okay to go to the SSPX. And one is... When you if you if you have a schismatic attitude and you're attending the SSPX because you think they're the true church or, you know, they're if you're going because you are trying to separate yourself from 
the body that would be you know so if they're saying the pope's to, name in the mass to, and things like that to be fair though the same can be said of any liberal parish well if someone's like, going there with the schismatic attitude I yeah I, I, exactly rob i want I, want, I, want, I love when they say well you know be careful with schismatic attitude it's like should i as opposed to what the apostasy attitude <laughs> what a stupid attitude it's like everyone becomes a bloody freudian it just drives me nuts how about you can't judge people's internals and you can only judge their externals so if somebody goes to the traditional mass and says the name pope francis when they pray the rosary all you have to go on is that they like the tlm and pray for pope francis you have no idea what they think about pope francis um these this is uh man oh man these these arguments against I sspx it's absurd I've never encountered anything that would make me hesitant when I go to the chapel near me. I mean, it's a Catholic parish. It's just not a parish. It's a chapel. You know, I mean, I go, I'm welcomed. I've never, I mean, I stay for coffee after I actually have more, you know, uh, they're, they're more friendly to me there than if I go to a, a typical parish. So, but yeah, it's just wild times, man. I, I, I had, well, the joke uh, is the joke is, is like, you know, everyone's freaked out about the Synod and the SSPX are like smoking a cigarette in the back and being like, <laughs> you heard of Vatican II? You know, I've been through this before. <laughs> you guys are all worried about the Synod. It's like you've never heard of collegiality. It's been happening for 50 years. Are you out of your mind? Like when people are like, oh, the Synod's so bad. I'm like, the Synod is literally every bishop's conference. They're just meeting together with a bunch of feminists and, and James Martin to do it worse than they've already been doing it. It's the same thing. Uh, the synod and synodality is is just collegiality with a stupider name, and yeah. and if and if you know your stuff, it's like this isn't a surprise at all. This is obviously what was going to happen. That's another thing too. One of the reasons why I well, I should say this: there is no other tradition where I live. So when people will say, "Why don't you go, uh, you know, this place or that place?" It's like. Uh, well, I can't. So that's a non-argument. My whole world is this like two hour radius where I can drive every Sunday and I don't really care how many XP or FSSP parishes there are in Indianapolis. That means nothing to me. Um, yeah. I'm happy if you go there and that's fun for you and have a good time. Um, but for me, the only thing was the SSPX and the only thing is and there'll never be anything else in our diocese because it's anti-traditional in our diocese. Um, but the nice thing about going to the SSPX, you know, the one thing you never have to worry about church politics. Because uh, there's never, there's just none of this nonsense. And the amazing thing is, I will raise my kids in the SSPX. Obviously, one day they'll like learn about the crisis in the church and that sort of stuff. But they won't be obsessed they, on Rome. They, they, they never. They live in this. They live in a. They live in. A, for them, Catholicism is just like. They, they, they understand there's a new mass and stuff. And it's like, we just don't do that. And like, we go there. And that's all it yeah. is. And there's no <clears throat> politics. There's no nothing. There's no like, well, we're going to have to go to the, uh, you know, confirmation prep over there. And like, dad's ticked off driving me to this thing. It's like, why is dad ticked off at the diocese? Isn't the church good? We're just going to skip all that. And it's wonderful. The, the, in, in some ways, as the church gets messier, the traditional movement keeps growing, right? Like if you, if you listen to a guy like Michael Matt, who was basically there since the founding of the traditional movement, he was confirmed by Lefebvre. They were having basement masses with eight people in them back yeah. then, where the crazier things seem to get, the more packed these traditional parishes get. It, it's the, the real Francis effect is the explosion of the traditional movement. Ironically. Yeah. Right. Ironically, that's that's the real Francis effect. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. Someone, I think, asked. Um, like, why is Francis so good with the SSPX? The story is the following, and it's been told many times by those who know Francis. Remember, Francis was very close with the SSPX in Argentina. Uh, the Argentinians, the Ar in, actually in Argentina, um, in Argentina, they have recognition in the government on because of the request of Pope Francis to be recognized as part of the Catholic Church for tax purposes. <laughs> so in Argentina, legally, you're Catholic by the request of Pope Francis when he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. So figure that out. Um, but he had a really good, he had a really good um, relationship with them because, you know, 
the SS, the priests of the SSPX don't take a vow of poverty. They don't need to because it just happens to them. Um, they don't have any diocesan funding. It's just, you know, living on a prayer, hoping a prayer. Uh, obviously, some of the places do really well, like St. Mary's, because that town is built up. But it's a lot of, like, really, you know, frugal way of life, you know, in order to do what they have to do. And so in, in Argentina, like, just being in the slums is, like, natural for them. So yeah. Pope Francis would go there and he'd be like, the only priests I see here are basically like liberation the theologians <laughs> and the SSPX. And the SSPX. And it's so, but for Francis, it's like, what have you done for me lately? That's all he cares about. This is why he'll ax some traditionally minded bishops, but he's not going to ax, I mean, probably not going to ax Bishop Schneider because Bishop Schneider's in the periphery. Bishop Schneider's in Kazakhstan in a place that's mostly Muslim. So that's cool. Whereas he's going to ask well, Bishop Strickland because he's in America where everyone carries a gun. He doesn't like that. There's also an aspect of, I think he really does mean it when he says everyone, everyone, right? And he he kind of wants to let the society do their thing in their little corner. Yeah, I think he wants all traditionalists in the society. He doesn't want any of the diod. That's what the traditionalist custodis is all about. He wants there to be them to still be part of the Catholic Church, but just in their own little corner, not making a mess, because the society gives him the least grief of the traditional movement. The traditionalists yeah. that give him the hardest time are the FSSP and the diocesans. You'll the never, you very just... rarely hear, uh, if ever, an SSPX priest. Well, first of all, they're never on social media. And if they are on YouTube, it's only permissions. You know, like if I have a priest on, the superior says it's okay. It's it's we we agree beforehand what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Like it's very respectful. Or they're on the SSPX podcast, you know, and um, and they never speak about the Pope. I mean, they never do because uh, not that not that there's not a point to doing it, but that's not like. <sighs> They're, they're living it. You know, people talk about resisting the Pope or whatever. Well, what is resisting the Pope? It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a particular thing. There's no, there's no thing where it's like, here's the handbook on how to resist the Pope. All there is, is there's this spirit in the church that is communist, modernist, whatever. And we're just not going to do that. That's, yeah. that's all there is. And they just do that. And actions speak louder than words, as they say. Man. Uh. All right. Well, we're going to wrap this up. I got uh hope nobody was offended by uh, our little fight at the beginning of the episode, guys. <laughs> it's just a differing in opinion. There was no uh, judging anybody for anything. Um, all right, Kennedy, what, what are you promoting? A men's conference. Um, uh, hope you both will be there. Rob, you live in Minnesota, right? I do. Yes, sir. So Ontario is just like Eastern Minnesota. So the weather will be the same for you or, or Minnesota is Southern Manitoba or Southern, <laughs> Southern. Yeah. Southwest. The border's only 20 miles away, but it's a four hour drive. Figure that one yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You have to take a ferry to get there. Oh, <laughs> A canoe. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. wait, so where the conference is, is actually North of Minnesota. No, I'm just joking. I'm just saying for Rob, it's not like going to a different country. Um, our fleet farmers just call it Canadian Tire, but it's the same store. Oh, and fleet farm is the best. It's the best store ever. Yeah, uh, I've never even heard of it. <laughs> it's amazing. So, but uh, Anthony, uh, we actually speak English in this country, so you're going to have to learn <laughs> the language before you come. But uh, I'll bring a translator. You might yeah. speak it, but you sure don't spell it right. Yeah, that's right. But anyway, yeah, so the Canadian Martyrs Men's Conference, everyone, it's $100. Obviously, it doesn't include all your accommodations. It includes all your food for like the day of the conference and stuff. But you have to do your own hotel yourself, whatever. Um, but it's hundred dollars Canadian, which is literally like seventy-two dollars US. So for seventy-two dollars US, uh, it's five or six talks, full full day of food and meals and whatever, um, refreshments. Everyone gets a cigar. Who attends the conference as well? Uh, we have a sponsor for that. And but the most important thing, obviously, is like the fact that the talks are great, and it's the only traditional Catholic men's conference in North America. It's the only one. There are men's conferences, but none of them are tra traditional Catholic men's conferences. Um, and it's in Stratford, Ontario, the weekend of February seventeenth. Come in on the Friday. We have a pub sorted out that will have like a room rented where we eat fish. We'll have fish and chips and order whatever. It's a Friday, so. Something meatless, and we'll drink beer and get to know each other. What's the, what's next, the date? February, the weekend of February 17th. 
February 17th. And is, um, that, is that drivable for me? Not nine hours, nine or ten hours. Yeah. Oof, that's a hike. I mean, it'd be like going to Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. Anyway, but uh, it's going to be a great time. Last year we had about 120. This year we're going to have. Uh, we're, we're booking a room with 200. It's a hotel. Uh, the prices are really reasonable. If you want to come down with some guys, we're going to have a bunch of guys from Michigan. One guy, uh, Kerry, if you're watching this, shout out. He's from South Dakota. He flew in last year. It was awesome. And then most of the guys are Canadian. But it's a wonderful thing. And uh, Tim Flanders is going to be there doing a talk. So uh, anyway, I recommend everyone do that. That's the main thing is is uh, is come to the conference. It's the, it's the best men's conference in North America. It's the best. All right. We'll help you promote that as it gets closer. Um, give your wife our best. We'll be praying for her. Um, Hey, what's this number seven? Six. We lost six. one. It would have been number seven. Oh. We yeah, but it's okay, number, so, number six. So number six. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. So Thursday night we have uh, Father Dave Nix coming on. We're doing Faith in Film. The first movie we are doing is A Man for All Seasons. Okay. So we're going to be discussing, um not just the movie itself, but like how it can be applied in situations we're in today and stuff. So it's going to be an interesting show. We're going to try and do this monthly. Uh, the first one's going to be a man for all seasons. I think the second one's going to be Padre Pio miracle man. And then we're going to ask for audience suggestions to see what they want to do going forward. <clears throat> so do God's not you should do the best Catholic movie ever. God's not dead. Oh my gosh, man. That movie's unbearable. <laughs> I did watch, um, what was it? Man of God. It's a, uh, it's an Orthodox but an Orthodox priest that that was pretty good. I enjoyed that one. Rob won't watch it because it's schismatic, he says, but not as bad as a movie about the SSPX, but <laughs> it's pretty close. <laughs> All right, Rob, Rob and I are gonna go fight in the green room <laughs> and hash this out. We'll see if Rob's gonna show up to the Faith and Film episode Thursday. I have to watch that movie first. All right, so there's, there's hope, guys. The the <laughs> the band's not breaking up yet. <laughs> All right. All right, Kennedy. Thank you for joining us, brother. We will uh, see you soon. Talk to you later, guys. All right, take it easy.